Yeah, let us now get to these nonlinear activation functions. So why are we interested in these nonlinear activation functions? Yeah, together with the hidden layers, they allow us to model complex nonlinear decision boundaries. So with that, we can solve complicated problems, complicated classification problems, for instance. Um, so, but before we take a look at these nonlinear activation functions more closely, let us briefly recap the PyTorch um, API. So this is uh, something I just copy and pasted from lecture five, where we already had a multi-layer multi perceptron just to illustrate how the PyTorch API works. So on the left-hand side, yeah, this is like the regular um, approach. So where we have uh, init, constructor and here this is a multi-layer perceptron with two hidden layers i called them linear one and linear two because linear because the layer is called linear it's computing the net input right so th these are our layers that we use and one output layer so this is essentially the setup that i showed you earlier um in the slide so if i just go back um so this is essentially this setup where we have one hidden layer second hidden layer and an output layer. Um, all right, so this is how it looks like. And in the forward method, we use these actual layers. So we apply the first hidden layer, then we have our nonlinear activation. Here it's a ReLU function. We will revisit this in a few slides. Then another uh, net input, another activation function, another net input, and then usually we would compute the softmax. Um, in PyTorch, recall we use this cross entropy loss, which already yeah computes the softmax for us, so we don't have to do it ourselves. So here we apply this uh, log softmax function on the logits. So there's also a softmax function, um, but here yeah we uh, compute this based on the we use the log softmax because it's numerically more stable if we were to use the negative log likelihood loss. Um, this is really though only if we want to use the negative log likelihood loss. Um, otherwise, we would just use softmax if we are interested in the probabilities. To be honest, <laughs> now looking at this, I don't know why I used log softmax. I think in the big code example, when I uh, created lecture five, I had um, the negative log likelihood here. So also technically, you don't have to compute the probabilities within this class. You can do this separately if you care about, because technically you never have to use the probability if you use the cross entropy function in PyTorch for optimization. But again, this will become more clear when we look at the concrete code example in the next video. On the right hand side, the main difference is that I'm using the sequential API, which can be a little bit more, I would say, uh, easier to read, more compact. So you, it's exactly the same network, um, except that here we define it and it, sequential can actually also run it. So we don't have to put it um, explicitly in the forward method. Uh, it will already do it for us if we call here my network. I just called it my network. So it is in a way a little bit more convenient. What's more convenient in particular is that we don't have to yeah, define these steps in the order these are used ourselves. And we can also just read right now from here how these layers are executed. They are executed from top to bottom. This is also the case here. But for example, if I want to know what linear one is, I have to go up and look it up here. So it's a little bit more, I would say error prone, whereas on the right hand side, we define it and we also directly use it in that order. So it's a little bit more, it's, it's a bit safer, I would say. So yeah, so the flow is we apply a linear layer, a nonlinear activation, a linear layer, nonlinear activation, and a linear layer. And that will produce our logits. And then if we're interested in that, the probabilities, but again, PyTorch in cross entropy already applies the softmax for us, so we don't have to do it ourselves. So technically we can skip this softmax step and don't have to use that. It's just like I usually like to in include the probabilities because I sometimes also print out the results from a model and uh, analyze it with um, plots and probability plots and stuff like that. So in that way, I sometimes find it helpful to have the probabilities available. So I usually save my results, but you don't have to worry about this really. All right, so with that, we can then solve the XOR problem 
using these nonlinear activation functions. So the nonlinear activation functions let us make complex decision boundaries, like I just said. So here, this is like a toy data set um, I made, just two features, x1 and x2, just for simplicity. Two classes, these orange ones and these um, blue dots. So the orange squares and the blue dots. On the left-hand side here, just for fun, I was applying a multi-layer perceptron with one hidden layer and a linear activation function. So recall the linear activation function looks like that. So you can see that on the left-hand side that it's a linear decision boundary, even though we have a hidden layer. By the way, I don't want to open the code uh, notebook right now because um, then I have to switch the screen again. But um, if you're interested, after watching this video, you can double check here under this link that this is indeed, the code is indeed correct. So you can reproduce these results if you don't believe me. But in any case, so you can see on the left-hand side, this is a linear decision boundary, even though we have a hidden layer. So what happened here? So because in logistic regression, we had a nonlinear activation function and no hidden layer. It was a linear decision boundary. Now we have a hidden layer and no uh, nonlinear activation. We also have a decision boundary that is linear. So let's recap logistic regression. No hidden layer plus nonlinear activation. gives us a linear boundary. MLP with, um, with linear activation plus hidden layer, also linear boundary. So from that we can deduce neither the hidden layer, which we have in the multilayer perceptron, nor the nonlinear activation function alone are sufficient for making a nonlinear decision boundary. They are necessary, but they are not sufficient for making a nonlinear decision boundary. In fact, we need both. We need both the hidden layers and the nonlinear activation functions to make a nonlinear decision boundary. So on the right hand side, I have now the same multilayer perceptron with one hidden layer, the same number of weights. The only difference is that I'm now using a nonlinear activation function. Here I'm using the ReLU function. And you remember, this is um, <laughs> yeah, very simple. It's actually just thresholded at zero. So if the input is negative, the output is zero, otherwise it's an identity function. So it's almost an identity function, but not quite. And this is sufficient together with the hidden layers to make a nonlinear decision boundary. You can see this decision boundary is now nonlinear. You can see it's solving this XOR problem. So it can now classify these data points correctly. So why is this working and why is this not working? So why is the linear decision um, uh, linear activation function not sufficient and produces a linear um, decision region. That's because if you think about it, even though we have a hidden layer, if we have a linear activation function, what happens is that we have essentially a combination of multiple linear functions and the combination of multiple linear functions is still a linear function. So. If we don't use nonlinear activation functions, then we don't really gain anything by using a hidden layer. So we need actually both hidden layers and nonlinear activation functions to produce these yeah, complex decision boundaries. Actually, there are way more than just ReLU functions. ReLU just happens to be popular because it's, it's quite simple and quite fast to compute and has also some other nice properties, which I will also briefly talk about um, in a few minutes. So, but yeah, traditionally, these are also yeah, one of the most um, popular activation functions in multilayer perceptrons. With that, I mean the logistic sigmoid that we already encountered in the context of logistic regression. So back in the day, I would say even the sigmoid was maybe the most popular activation function in multilayer perceptrons. But again, it has this problem that these gradients saturate here. 
Another very popular activation function for a while was the 10H function. It's also a sigmoidal. So both are sigmoidal functions. It's also a sigmoidal function, so S-shaped. Um, but this uh, hyperbolic tangent function looks a little bit different. So you can see this one, uh, the logistic sigmoid function, is centered around 0 and the output is 0.5, whereas this one is centered at 0 and the output uh, at 0 is also 0. So it's producing positive and negative values, which can be an advantage. There's also a hard tench, which is essentially very similar to 10H, except that uh, it's thresholded here, similar to ReLU. So what is the advantage of, let's say, the 10H over the sigmoid activation? So the advantage of 10H is really like that we have this centering at uh, 0, so that we have positive and negative values. And you can also see it's uh, steeper. So here, the it's steeper than this one, so we have larger gradients. It has also a very simple derivative, 1 minus 10h. Recall for the logistic sigmoid, the derivative was um, like this. So itself times 1 minus itself. So the derivative is slightly um, smaller because it's uh, yeah, multiplying two numbers smaller than um, 1 with each other. So whereas here you have 1 minus this one. Um, but then yeah, you have also the squared here. So it's actually not that different. <laughs> okay, um, yes, yeah, so, but both have the problem that if you make a wrong prediction, it's both if you make a right or wrong prediction, but in both cases, you here and here, so you saturate it. So that, that can be a problem. If you make a wrong prediction, you end up with a very small partial derivative with with respect to its well, derivative with respect to its input and then when you compute the partial derivatives uh, in the chain rule then yeah you will get very small gradients and the learning will be very slow which can be a disadvantage or maybe one more thing about why it's good to have um, negative and positive values that just gives you more combinations so imagine you initialize your weights from let's say a small uh, from a random normal distribution standard normal distribution, let's say, or a scaled standard normal distribution. So you initialize your weights such that they are centered at zero. So you can have positive and negative starting weights. And if you also use this 10H, um, which can have positive and negative values, you get just more combinations of possible values, whether you combine a positive with a negative number, a negative with a positive number, two negative numbers or two positive numbers, you have four different ways you can combine these signs. Whereas if you have an activation function that can only produce positive numbers, you're a little bit more limited. So I would say the 10H is a little bit more expressive. It allows you a little bit more yeah, explicit expressivity, if that's a word. Um, but yeah, I think also in practice when I use them, when I recall, I only saw a minor difference using one over the other. Really, if you use a ReLU function, that gives you a better bang for the buck, usually. So yeah, here are some more nonlinear activation functions, including the ReLU function. So the ReLU function here, um, that's something you have seen before. It's, I would say, still the most widely used activation function in um, deep learning. I think it's maybe 10 years old by now, something like that. But uh, when you look at um, recent papers, people still use a ReLU a lot. It has really nice properties. It's um, simple to compute, really, and you have always uh, yeah, large derivative, the derivative is 1. So if you use the chain rule and your derivative is 1, if the inputs are positive, then yeah, you don't diminish the product in the um, chain rule. Okay, but it can also be uh, 0, which can be a problem. So if you have negative inputs to this activation function, your, um, your output would be 0, which will then basically cancel the weight update for that uh, corresponding weight corresponding to this activation or connected to this activation. So um, that can be a problem if you always have very negative inputs. So there is a problem called dying neurons or dead relus that happens usually when you have uh, 
somehow updated the weights such that you will never come into the positive region anymore. And then, yeah, you will never be able to update your weights again because the derivative will always be zero. That can be a problem. However, in practice, some people argue it can also be an advantage because it can help with pruning, uh, let's say, unnecessary neurons. Like if you have an excessive number of neurons, this way you can get rid of some of them and it may help with preventing overfitting. Uh, a version of ReLU that some people find to perform sometimes a little bit better is the leaky ReLU, which doesn't have the problem of these dying neurons. So here the difference is that we have, so if we look at the simplified notation, the, um, the piecewise linear function here, um, what you can see here, uh, or the piecewise function, sorry, what you can see here is that the only difference is that we have now this alpha here, which is a slope if the input is smaller than zero. So for the negative region here, we have now a slope. What value we can choose for the slope? It's a hyperparameter, right? So hyperparameters is something that you as the practitioner have has to cho choose. So there's no way you let's say can know what's a good value if it's a hyperparameter it's um something you have to try out and practice and change and see what performs better i have seen all kinds of values for this um negative slope here or for the slope in the negative region so in keras that's a api for tensorflow i believe they use 0.3 as the default value in pytorch i don't know exactly the default i usually specify it myself i usually use something like 0.1 or 0.01 but yeah there are different values that work well for different problems in practice you will only see a slight small difference so it's not something if your network let's say doesn't perform very well then choosing a uh, different value here probably won't make a big difference. So you have probably bigger problems to fix. But it can give you maybe one, two, three percentage points in terms of accuracy if you are lucky. Um, I said uh, hyperparameters cannot be like automatically learned from gradient descent. However, people designed a parameterized version of uh, the leaky ReLU. It's called prelu, parameterized uh, ReLU basically. And here this uh, is essentially the same as above, but here the people made it, made alpha a trainable parameter. So it's a parameter that can be also updated with gradient descent. So in practice, I honestly never really, have never really seen this being used. I'm not sure if this is really that useful. Um, there's also an ELU, an exponential linear unit. So it's uh, getting around this kink here. It's like a, more like a smooth version here in this kink. So there are different types, really many, many different types of nonlinear activation functions. There's also, I recall, there's a CELU. I've seen that quite often recently. It's, um, I think it stands for self-normalizing exponential linear unit. So it has some nice properties also. But yeah, again, there are lots of different flavors usually. Um, people still use the ReLU a lot because it just performs well. Yeah, related to the topic of nonlinear activation functions, I saw this paper here last year called Smooth Adversarial Training. I bookmarked it because I knew it would become handy when I teach a yeah, class on deep learning. So uh, adversarial training, just briefly, what is adversarial training? Adversarial training is yeah, um, exploiting deep neural networks or more like fooling deep neural networks it's if you have uh, let's say an image or some data point and your network makes a prediction let's say you have an image of a cat it predicts cat there's some way you can exploit the network by just changing the image very slightly making like a few pixel changes but you find these pixel changes that are yeah, able to fool the network to let's say now think that the image is a dog instead of a cat so it's like um, exploiting weaknesses in the network. So like the authors say, it is commonly believed that networks cannot be both accurate and robust. So usually if you want to make your network more robust towards these adversarial examples, you usually trade it off by, yeah, um, by suffering in terms of accuracy. So the accuracy is usually lower in these more robust networks. So like they say, gaining robustness means losing accuracy. However, um, 
yeah, uh, let me just read it. <laughs> Our key observation is that the widely used ReLU activation function significantly weakens adversarial training due to its non-smooth nature. So it sounds like yeah, the ReLU is like a little bit of a disadvantage for adversarial training. Hence, we propose smooth adversarial training in which we replace ReLU with its smooth approximations to strengthen adversarial training. So the authors argue um, that if you replace this ReLU here in red with this uh, non-smooth point here with a smooth version, for example, the parametric soft plus function, then yeah, you can strengthen it because now maybe it has something to do with um, the gradients because here you have this big difference, whereas here you have also something in between. So now this is maybe um, helping with this adversarial training. So based on their experiments. Yeah, and the second reason why I like this paper is because they have a nice summary of the smooth approximations of the non-smooth ReLU function. So on the left hand side this is how the activation functions look like. They call it here the forward path and then here are the derivatives for the backward path on the right hand side. So yeah you can see these are all slightly different but they are all kind of approximating yeah, the ReLU in some way. In practice, um, yeah in practice this has a big implication up apparently for the adversarial robustness, but also, like I said, um, choosing different activation functions uh, that are relatively similar, it doesn't make a big impact in practice. So also what they see here, it's just one percentage point. So one percentage point between ReLU and the others. So it helps a little bit. These, some of these others perform actually better, a little bit better. It's not huge, but it's a little bit better. So it's in a way it doesn't hurt using them. But on the other hand, you can see there's a huge advantage in terms of adversarial robustness from 33% up to 42%. It's almost yeah, 10%, 10% difference in terms of adversarial robustness. So given that, um, I mean, it's not much work to just replace ReLU with one of these non uh, other nonlinear activation functions, uh, given that it's not much work, why not doing it, right? So it's actually quite interesting. Yeah, and because uh, activation functions are quite boring, I have a quite fun visualization here I just saw today, coincidentally. So that's these uh, dance moves of deep learning activation functions. With that, I want to end this video. And then in the next video, we will talk a little bit more about multilayer perceptrons and in particular, coding it up in PyTorch and training it.